Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in once again. And don't mind me, I'm just in the Hesperides. You already know, to marry the beloved land, the real promised land, the true old world. Before I begin the video today, I just wanted to say, you know, thanks to all the supporters, the new subscribers, all the nice comments. I really appreciate it. All my Patreons for holding me up. Anyone who has ever shared any information with me to go ahead and put in videos and investigate further. I really appreciate all the help. Today we're just going to be talking about so-called Lemuria. Where's the true origin of this story? I'm going to show you guys what really influenced the whole story of Lemuria. It was this big archaeological, um, actually many archaeological digs that they did in Mexico. They found some incredible things here. We're going to go over it today. I have done this topic before. Just wanted to add this book. It's like the life story and also the findings of the person who did all these archaeological digs. And then we're going to get into how he influenced somebody to write a, a story about Lemuria. These findings is what made the Lemuria story, you know, famous. But again, these findings were done in Mexico. Uh, let's get right into the video. Hope you guys enjoy it. Again, thanks for uh, tuning in once again. So this is the book we're going to get into today. It's called Berry Cities for God and Gods. William Niven's Life of Discovery and Revolution in Mexico and the American Southwest. So here, uh, this is in the beginning of the book, it has this image right here. This is William Niven. So it's here, William Niven, surrounded by his archaeological collection. Let me go ahead and zoom in for you guys. It says, Mexico City, April 14th, 1918, inscribed on back amongst the idols that I have dug up near Salco. This is my selfish pleasure. Whoa, you hear what he's saying? So this is what he found there. All right, all this stuff. And you guys are going to see how deep this was, where he found this stuff. Okay, we're going to go over that. All right, so a little closer look. You can see. All right. I'm just going to basically uh, skim through uh, the chapters just so you guys can see. Uh, there's a backstory behind him. This is literally like an autobiography because it's uh, his diary notes and also the people who knew him. So just so you know, uh, in 1865, the Neven family lived in a two-story, two-widowed blockhouse on Shots Road in the village of Belshill, Lacknashire, southeast of Glasgow, Scotland. All right, so he's Scottish. It says here the land of snow and silver. It says here eventually uh, Neven reached New York City on April 15th, completing the 3,102-mile Atlantic crossing in 10 days. From there, he went to Providence, Rhode Island, where he lived with Robert Neven family for nine months. I believe they're talking about 1879 when he got to America. Again, New York and Rhode Island. So it goes on to say, you know, he took some odd jobs here and there to survive. Then eventually he uh, started doing prospecting, right? Getting minerals. He was interested in that. And so he started doing his own little thing on, on that. And he literally became an expert in this. So he was going to many uh, mining camps, all right? It says, seized by the mining fever, Niven arrived in Las Vegas, New Mexico in July, 1880. While there, he met Governor Lou Wallace and took out his naturalization papers on July 4th. So it says, Governor uh, Lou Wallace actually wrote the novel Ben-Hur. 
Hmm, interesting. That same month, he joined company with John Batters, an Englishman, and Kenneth McLean, a fellow Scott. They bought a wagon, two horses, a tent, and a grub, sufficient for a six-month trek into the missing country of New Mexico. After wandering through various mining camps, they found a promising locality about 30 miles south of Santa Fe in the Galuri Mountains, where they prospected and worked small mining contracts. They found some gold and silver, but it usually cost $2 to recover $1 worth of precious metal. Nevin became an expert miner and could work 10 to 12 hour days with pick and shovel or drill hammer. At 166 pounds, I was full of health and vigor, and it was fortunate I had as much strength we had spent all our money. In May 1881, it was discovered that the claim they had been working was part of an old Spanish land grant. Each man was left to fend for himself. So, you know, he's going through a lot of things. I just want to read that so you guys can see. And uh, But at the same time, he's becoming an expert at, as a mineralogist, right? So I hope you guys see eventually that's what led him to, to go to Mexico, you know, looking for minerals. And that's when he started finding these archaeological things. So... Again, his life story and his journey as a mineralogist in different parts of uh, North America. Uh, this photo right here is William Niven uh, in Lincoln County. And um, he's doing an exposition where his minerals that he found. There's actually an Indian chief here, they're saying. So it's here, Lincoln County Mineral Display. Group includes William Niven and Center, flanked by his partner, Lee H. Rudisile, Mescalero Apache Chief. San Juan and Agent W.H.H. Llewellyn, Thirty Millennial Exposition, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 1883. This is uh, William Niven and his mineral store at 739 741 Broadway, New York City. Okay, again, he became an expert mineralogist. So again, his uh, prospecting led him to Mexico. Uh, this chapter says here, Unknown Guerrero. That's a, a part of Mexico, Guerrero, Mexico, where he had uh, ended up. It says here in the latter part of 1890, Niven set out for Mexico in search of mineral specimens for his institutional clients. One mineral of particular interest was an unusual rose-colored garnet, samples of which had been sent to France in 1871. The garnets were said to come from a Rancho San Juan, Mexico. The exact location was unknown. As Niven traversed the Mexican countryside, he found Rancho San Juan in virtually every state from the U.S. border all the way to Mexico City. The search seemed hopeless. Niven stopped at the fabled San Carlos silver mine in Guanajuato, where he identified a new sulfur selenide of silver, which he named Aguilarite, in honor of the superintendent of the mine. All right, so his last name was probably Aguilar. When he reached Pachuca, Hidalgo, Niven met with Mr. Francisco Landero and Icos, owner of the Rio del Monte mine, one of the richest silver deposits in Mexico. Landero's extensive collection of Mexican minerals included specimens of the rose garnet, identified as coming from a small town called Chalostoc, near Cuatla in the state of Morelos. Niven had finally located the source of the elusive mineral. All right, so that's a little backstory when he got to uh, Mexico. That's what his interest was, you know, really. And here's an image of William Niven, and you're going to say him with his uh, pistol. It says William Niven with pistol and mining hammer. Omitlan Guerrero. Omitlan Guerrero, all right, with his pistol. There's a cowboy. And here is a picture. It says view of Rose Garnet Quarry, Shalos Tok, near Cahuitla, Morelos. It says Niven proceeded next to Xipancingo. Xipango, huh? Sipango, Sipancingo, capital of the neighboring state of Guerrero, where he was graciously received by the Governor General Francisco O. Arce. Although Niven's primary interest was in the mineral wealth of the state at the governor's mansion, Niven examined a large collection of antiquities, among them a number of clay pots, ornaments, and stone sculptures of a sort different than those he had previously encountered. Arce informed Niven that they came from an extensive ruined city near the village of Xochipala, some 20 miles north and west of Xilpancingo. Niven determined to visit the ruined city with the assistance of Governor Arce. Niven selected four local men to accompany him and outfitted them with horses, blankets, and firearms. On a bright December morning, they set out for the Rio Balsas, an untamed river known for its torrential rapids and high mountains denying access to all but the most determined. 
As Niven stood on the side of Supango's main barranca, he gazed across at a thick white line protruding from the brown clay wall 100 feet away. At first, it appeared to be a simple streak of limestone. Gradually, he made out a layer of white bones, a foot thick and a thousand feet long, and now knew where the name of the town came from. Niven obtained permission from the Indian owner of the land and set his men to work with hoe and shovel. What they uncovered was a vein of death. Niven had often heard of stories about mysterious lights, luminous shapes in the night, which were believed to point to buried treasure. The lights, Niven now realized, were caused by the dampness during the rainy season, reacting with the phosphorus in the bones. He followed the bones for a quarter mile up the barranca until he came upon traces of a prehistoric ruin, okay? Prehistoric ruin. Spread out before him were the foundations of houses. Foundations of houses regularly laid out. Streets, a temple, a large blockage mound. All right, we're talking about streets. We got my whole town, a whole city. A temple, a large blockage mound, and innumerable artifacts strewn across the landscape. This, he discerned, was the source of the bones that had been washed down to the mesa below by seasonal rains and flooding. All right, so real quick before I continue, uh, look at this picture, guys. You see this wall right here? It's like some kind of wall, man-made or whatever. It says, view of ruins, Keko Mi Tlipan Guerrero, showing 20-foot wall of temple. Indian boy at left provides scale. The walls were built directly against the cliff face, a major portion of which has fallen away into the barranca. All right, and here's another image, uh, a ruins, a wall here, or temple they're saying. It says, view of ruins, Kecho Mi Tlipan Guerrero, Niven photo 100, the remains of sections of walls composed of roughly shaped stones, first alerted William Niven to presence of ruins and a track to become known as Omitlan. And right here, some more ruins. They're saying they're excavating an altar here that's buried. All right. Oh, this is buried. Excavating altar, Habalin Guerrero. Here we got another uh, image. Again, this is, was all buried. All right. Look at that. They excavated all this. It says excavating altar, tools in a hole, Habalin Guerrero. Okay. And more images. Again, more ruins. You see that? Just like what Paul, kind of like what Paul Cook be finding in England and all these other places. Look at that. This is a cool little artifact uh, he found. Check it out. And it says, seated wrestler with tattoo-like markings on face. From chamber under wall at Quechomitlipan, Alabaster, three and a half feet high. Present whereabouts unknown. They don't know what happened to it. The sunburst-like markings on the face may indicate royal status. And this is an image right here. It says old man seated next to a stale, ancient stale. Quechua Mitlipan Guerrero, all right? Look at that with inscription or a drawing or carving. Wow, right in the middle, you know, the jungle or forest session. And even returned in early April to New York City, where Morris K. Jessup, well-known banker and president of the American Museum of Natural History, purchased a Guerrero Jade sculpture for the museum, alerted to the prospect of further significant finds from the region. Jessup agreed to defray the expenses of a journey through Guerrero the following year. In May of 1892, Niven was made an honorary life member of the museum. So you see that? So they financed him, the American uh, Museum, National Museum, they financed him. It was like, yeah, hey, we're, you know, go bring us all those artifacts. And then they made him an honorary member. <laughs> Great enthusiasm was also felt for the garnet find in Morelos. Samples were cut into the columns and the sections and polished. Upon analysis, the stone was found to be composed of grossularite, a silicate of lime and alumina formed in wallistonite, a white limestone and associated with vesuvianite. <laughs> the red garnets and the bright yellow of the vesuvianite produced a striking contrast hope i ain't killing these words <laughs> but all you see all these are minerals and now the museum's involved so now there's an actual expedition this is a picture of uh i guess uh says american rose garnet company i believe they had in new york it says william niven and sample of rose garnet new york city yeah that's where it's at 
So several carloads of Rose Garner were shipped to New York in mid February 1893, destined for the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, huh? They were received with considerable acclaim. The Mexican trader announced that Rose Garnet surpassed in beauty the famous Russian Rhodonite. This newest production from Nature's Laboratory is destined to rank in the foremost place amongst the first class decorative stones of the world. Its commercial success seemed assured. In the summer of 1893, Neven prepared for his second journey to Yerba Buena. Armed with his temporary concession from President Porfirio Diaz, a first class camping outfit, cameras, and 500 photographic plates, an Indian servant, mule tier, three mules, and four pack animals, he started out from Cahuitla, Morelos, on July 29. So eventually, you know, he's given the rights. Again, he came back from New York ready to go excavate. He went to the uh, last uh, ruins he had found. Uh, it says here, after a half day's ride, they reached the ruins, broken walls, ruined buildings, huge in size beyond comprehension, guys. Look, mark the slopes as far as the eye could reach. Once this was a rolling plateau, dropping gently away from the mountain wall. But now it is cut into giant ridges by gorges from 200 to 1,000 feet deep. Gorges whose sides are scarred with broken buildings. Broken buildings, ridges covered with ruins of great houses, some of them larger than those of Mitla in the state of Oaxaca. Neven eventually found the trail that he had followed in 1891. For the second time, he surveyed the site. They seemed to me even more wonderful than before. It must have been an immense nation that once dwelt here. And this city or chain of cities, all right, cities or district or feudal estate, as you may wish to call it, must have been fully as large as Babylon or Thebes or Memphis. All right, what are they really finding here? Listen to this. It had to have been as large as Babylon or Thebes or Memphis. What are they really finding here? What if it is the real Babylon or Thebes or Memphis or other famous cities of antiquity? Its buildings, save those that had been erected on the tops of huge pyramidal bases, were of rather low construction but so massive as to give the appearance of fortresses rather than homes, all right? Fortresses rather than homes. So again, I'm just skipping through this. I just want to read some of the diary notes so you guys can see what he's finding here. We're going to show a lot more. It says here, the next morning, explorations began in earnest because the site ran on for more than 40 miles. And even estimated that there were 300 square miles of ruins in the heart of the track. One promising area at which to begin digging was the interior of a large temple with an altar of solid masonry 15 feet on a side and some 20 feet high. Many such altars were scattered throughout the ruins and even speculated that they were most likely used for sacrificial purposes. All right? he, he's just adding that conjecture. So many altars, all right? Done about 300 square miles of ruins, guys. What happened to these archaeological sites? What happened? They didn't teach us about this. Some distance beyond this, they came upon an immense wall, which rose 30 feet into the air, more than 200 feet in length. The wall was made of 12 by 18 inch carved stone blocks. Listen, guys. All right. Laid evenly with a white cement as an adhesive. Come on now. Are we just talking about geopolymer? After digging under one side of the wall for nearly a full day, they came upon a large underground chamber with plastered walls. Fragments of timber lay on the floor. In the center of the chamber was a long carved altar of green diorite, the weight of which Neven estimated at several tons, although its sides, ends, and top were curious carvings. Beads, stone knives, small idols, and fragments of larger images were scattered throughout the interior. All were made of green or gray diorite, of various shapes and sizes, but all, no matter how weirdly shaped, show strivings after the human form, all right? They're man-made. Some are fairly well-proportioned, while others of the most hideous conception, with huge heads and abnormally long faces. Others, again, have small bodies and exceedingly large legs. Some are hunchbacks and others are grotesque. After four months of exploration, Neven returned to New York with his bounty and prepared to move his family to Chicago 
for the duration of the Chicago World's Fair, where he was in charge of the exhibit for the American Rose Garnet Company. Even before the close of the fair, however, Niven returned to Mexico, anxious to pursue his explorations of Guerrero. On Wednesday, May 23rd, 1894, he departed Cahuitla, Morelos, by train bound for the wilds of Guerrero once more, intent on bringing to light more ancient relics and mineral deposits of economic value. Niven arrived at Chochipala on the evening of June 28th. So on the 29th, uh, he went with another Indian, you know, to visit some ruins about 20 miles from the town he was in. They continued for more than six hours uphill and then stopped to prepare lunch. Niven wondered about the significance of what he was seeing. On the summit and sides of a range of mountains west of Xochipala, Guerrero, I have ridden two days among the ruins of a prehistoric city over 10 miles long. The houses substantially built of stone and lime have been from 8 feet to 50 feet square. The walls, many of which are standing from 3 feet to 10 feet high, vary in thickness from 2 to 6 feet. As the nearest water is several miles distant, the question arises, how did those people exist? Who were they? All right, who are you, man? They don't know. They don't know. Why did they build cities among mountain peaks? Why? Highlanders, huh? Amongst the mountains. The only record they have left us are strange, but in many cases, skillfully fashioned objects of beautiful jade, serpentine, trashite, etc., representing the form of odd-looking human figures, snakes, etc., and peculiar characters and hieroglyphics, which thus far have defied the skill of the scientists to decipher, all right? Writing, hieroglyphics, remember? This is to Mary, from these silent witnesses, Will it ever be possible to unravel the hidden mystery of their remarkable existence? All right, this is his journals and diaries. He's, this is William Niven, all right? This is the main character, what we're going to be talking about today, where somebody took his whole story, this everything he's finding here, and turned it into Lemuria. So basically, the book keeps going, how he, you know, his whole story is going back and forth, New York, back to Mexico. He keeps bringing back stuff. And he keeps coming back to these places like Xochipala. Uh, right here, uh, it says, Niven returned in late October to New York City, where he reported his exploits to the New York press. Ruins of a big city. Lucky New Yorker found a lost metropolis in Mexico. Great wealth uncovered. Many excavations discovered, filled with specimens of old time. Bones of strange animals there. Remains of ancient temples of which he has taken many photographs. Nevin's article, Remarkable Discovery of the Ruins of Prehistoric City in Mexico, appeared in the American Antiquarian and Oriental Journal on November 1st. The New York Tribune published something about William Niven, discovered. By early 1897, the ruins were given a new name, Omitlan, a shortened version of the unwidely Quechomitlipan. D.G. Brinton, all right, we've read many of his books, uh, Brinton's, an eminent Americanist at the University of Pennsylvania published a notice on Omitlan in science. Other journal notices followed. All right, so again, we're just following the story a little bit, all right? So back in New York, Niven addressed the American Geographical Society in 1897. His talk, A Prehistoric City of Mexico, delivered before an audience of 800, was illustrated by 63 stereo-opticon views which vividly pictured the ruins of the ancient city of Omitlan. A newspaper article published the following day reported that Mr. Neven feels that he has only begun his work. There's a picture of William Neven, it says here, in the Cave of Skulls and Echo Macho built Guerrero, 1902. All right, so uh, the book continues talking about, you know, how he also went there to prospect and get minerals. So it, it keeps going on about how much he's finding there, all these minerals, gold, and all this other stuff. Uh, I found this picture here. I thought it was interesting, just so you guys can, again, get an idea when we're talking about uh, Indians. The Indian mail carrier with bag, G. Niven, Tlacotepec, Guerrero, 1900, all right? So, all right, that's him right there, as you guys can see. Here he is colorized, all right? As you guys can see, couple colored tribes of America, so swarthy, all right? So that's what I was saying, break your stereotypes. Yeah. So again, he was not only there, you know, 
doing the explorations. He was there prospecting, doing a lot of mining. Many, many pages of this book talks about uh, his prospecting there. Nothing to do with the archaeological stuff. Just some more pictures. I thought this one was very interesting. How huh? see those blocks behind the guy? I mean, is, did they make that? They don't look like they made those. Those look really big. The description only says miners at work clearing out channel and building site of support for water wheel. All right. I don't think they built those. Those look like some megalithic rocks right next to him. Again, more images of them prospecting. It says here William Niven. So this is for crushing ore. It says here they build this. So again, there he's there taking the resources as well. So we belly flop to this uh, chapter or part of the book. Uh, page 141 says Placidas de Loro. So, you know, after reading so much, uh, I skipped a lot, but he found so much gold, guys. He was getting so much gold. It was talking about. Uh, but then he, uh, in this chapter says, while waiting for the boats to be constructed, Niven heard from an old Indian in Cuernavaca about some extraordinary ruins along the Balsas River in the municipality of Coyuca de Catalan. The site was one mile north of Placidas de Loro. When Niven arrived there, he found three great pyramids, okay? Three great pyramids, about 35 to 40 feet in height, arranged along the river. Yearly floods of the Rio del Oro had eaten away at the western shore until nearly one quarter of the pyramids had disappeared into the river. Listen to this. Revealing their platform bases made from water-worn boulders. Niven pitched camp in the ruins. On the north side of the center pyramid, about 20 feet above the river and 15 feet from the surface of the ground, a corner of large cut stone projected about six inches from the perpendicular bank. This proved to be a tablet of diorite 42 inches long. All right, a tablet 24 inches wide and three inches thick, lying directly on top of another tablet of similar material and dimensions. These tablets appear to have been set up at one time to form the walls of a box or tomb. Clinging precariously to the bank of the river, Neven began to dig with his small geological pick and uncovered a third stone tablet. This one was slightly smaller than the others, measuring 28 by 18 by 3 inches, the lower side covered with unusual carvings. And here's an image of one of the uh, associated tablets or slabs or slab B. And from Placeres de Loro Guerrero, okay. And here says a view of an incense burner, all right, an incense burner and diorite jade head associated with the tablets. Contents of the incense burner are still intact. The linear treatment of the facial features, as well as the simple decoration of the incense burner, are typical of Mezcala style art from Guerrero. So Underneath or beneath uh, the other tablets, right, they, they saw another tablet lying face down. In the space between two tablets, Niven recovered a gray diorite, incense burner, and a smaller incense burner filled with teeth. On one corner of the burner was a flat green jade amulet on which was carved a human face with perforations for a string at the top of the forehead and tip of the chin. At the center of the lower tablet was a small metate or diorite with a turtle-shaped head. It had a slight depression in the middle, perhaps for grinding paints or herbs. A diorite cylinder was also found. Twelve shells, each almost exactly three inches in diameter, were found in two rows, close to the metate. Each shell contained 50 flat, circular shell beads, making a total of 600 beads. All right, and here's an image of says here other artifacts found in association with the tablets and incense burner include human bone a metatian roller, obsidian quartz, beads, ceramics, and shell ornaments, an example of which is shown below. Shell bracelet with incised decorations of monkeys. And this is another artifact, as you guys can see. Neven recovered considerable quantities of artifacts now identified as Mezcala style throughout the central Balsas region. The beads illustrated here note the linear incision were found at Supango del Rio. Continuing further ahead in the book, uh, it says here, Atzca Pozalco, all right, 1909 and 1912. It says here, I go out every Sunday to Atzca Pozalco and get many good Indian objects for almost nothing. He says, I get them for free. William Neven, June 5th, 1911. So on one of these uh, expeditions, right, in this town, 
So there was some Indian clay pits. It says here, the following Sunday, Niven and an Indian took the tram to Atska Pozalco, a few miles distant, and walked west for about a mile and a quarter to the village of San Miguel Amantra. Indians had worked for years in the clay pits making adobe bricks, which provided the raw material for building in Mexico City since at least the 16th century. Some of the pits that Niven examined were major excavations, 10 to 12 feet deep, 30 to 50 feet wide, and 100 feet long. On the north side of one of the pits, Neven could make out three distinct layers of gravel, sand, and ashes, over and under, the clay extending from 5 to 10 feet below the surface of the ground. He secured additional workers, furnished them with picks and shovels, and began to dig. The field was rich with ancient artifacts, okay? I'm going to show you with the image. He worked for six hours and moved several tons of earth, the Indian guide helped him carry the load back to the city. The load consisted of over 100 terracotta heads, whirls, dishes, small incense burners, diorite celts, one jade bead, two human skulls, and various human bones. And even returned the following Sunday, he obtained permission from the Mexican government to continue his digging. Neven visited all the clay pits of the little villages of the valley over an area of 20 square miles and rented an Indian farm that seemed to give good indications. Fragments of broken Aztec pottery were scattered over the surface. Okay, so I'm going to back up. I'm going to show you this image right here, okay? This is William Neven, and he's finding, look what he's finding, and down below, we're talking about several feet below and the strata, we're going to see what that means because that's going to tell you how old these artifacts are. Shouldn't be there. All right, here is a colorized version of this, again, from an uh, old video that we are going to remaster and go over today again uh, after this uh, book that we're reading. But as you guys can see, this is what he was finding over there. We're going to see how significant this finding was. It proves America is the true old world. So back in the book, it says, by April 1910, the American Museum of Natural History showed an interest in his excavation and sent representatives to examine his diggings. The party included Herman C. Bumpus, director of the museum. Neven expanded his area of exploration over an area of about 2,000 square miles in the Valley of Mexico, from Texcoco to Tlatne Pantala. Neven examined hundreds of clay pits. Neven confined his excavations to a region of 100 square miles. At many sites, he found two or three floors or pavements, listen, two or five meters from the surface. On the first floor or pavement was a two to three meter deposit of pebbles, sand, and small boulders covered with rich soil of the valley, in which he found innumerable fragments of broken pottery and small clay figures, diorite beads, spindle whirls, and so forth. The second rock hard pavement was from three-fourths to one meter beneath the first. In the intervening space, he found not a single piece of pottery or anything to indicate that people had dwelt there. Now listen to this. So these are layers. He's talking about different time periods, layers, as he's digging down. So after these two layers, there's a third layer. says underneath this second pavement was a well-defined layer of ashes and charcoal from three centimeters to one meter thick. Finds beneath this last layer included terracotta, figurines, human bones and skulls and cylinder seals. At another site less than five kilometers distant, Neven found an ancient riverbed, in the gravel of which were small figurines and terracotta, many of them rounded like pebbles. Dr. Edward Seller, a noted German archaeologist whose views were widely respected, examined Neven's finds. This river, said Dr. Seller, on seeing the gravel pit, and the small portion of the ruins exposed was here long before the lakes of the Valley of Mexico. This is before the lakes were here. Listen, and if the river is this old, as the indisputable proof of geology plainly tells, then the city is buried beneath all this sand and gravel must have been hundreds, if not thousands of years older than the capital of Tenochtitlan, which Cortez found when he came here. You guys hear this? This is really, really old. It's under before the lakes and rivers were formed. This is how significant this finding was. 
Nevin continued his excavations and secured annual contracts from farmers in the Valley of Mexico. During a period of more than 15 years, he rented successfully 14 small farms, averaging about half an acre each, and dug trenches 10 to 15 feet deep all over the ground, employing the Indian owners, usually two or three of them, to do the work. More than 100,000 tons of earth were removed. Unique artifacts went to the National Museum in Mexico City. The rest were sold in Neven's store to help pay the workers who assisted him. As his work progressed, he speculated about how the layers came to be deposited. From the work I have done and the examinations I have made of hundreds of clay pits for several years past, it appears to me that millions of people dwelt here. Millions, guys, listen, this is ancient, tens of thousands of years ago. He's saying tens of thousands of years ago, millions of people were living there when some of the adjacent volcanoes suddenly burst into activity, starting a calm flagration that completely destroyed the entire city or nation, covering a space of 3,000 square miles. It's buried under volcanic ash and lava. It's that old. This overwhelming catastrophe was in all probability subsequently followed by a flood that would account for the layer of ashes lying beneath the second concrete floor or pavement constructed by some strange unknown race, okay? Followed by a flood. We're talking about the Great Flood. And this same people might also have constructed the first pavement owing to the sinking of the land through some seismic disturbance, which would also explain why there appears to be no objects left between the two floors. The gravel on the first pavement would indicate that this second race perished by flood, and the Aztecs would therefore be the third race. Wow, you guys see this? So he's saying it's matching like the Popo Vu, right? They're saying different ages, just like in the old, the ancient uh, legends and myths about what age they were in, right? They're in the fifth age or the fourth age. The pottery and figures were found at the lowest depths, oftentimes 15 feet from the surface. And it is reasonable to suppose that a people of such culture and such numbers, probably millions, might have had imposing temples and edifices as in southern Mexico. If so, when they are uncovered by future explorations, the ashes that overlie them will perhaps have preserved most of the contents like Pompeii and Herculaneum. In this brief article, I have been unable to give more than a plain statement of facts, okay? Facts. He's not making any of this up, all right? He was telling you facts. This was hidden from us. This wasn't really emphasized in school. Nobody really paid attention to it. And then you got your little show over there on the other side of the world in, in Egypt over there. That's getting all the hype. But there is much evidence discovered which may eventually prove that Mexico, as some writers have declared, is actually the cradle of the human race. Okay, this is what William Neven said because of what he's finding. And many people supported what he said. All right, the cradle of the human race. We're talking about America, the true old world. You've been seeing everything in reverse. That's why you don't know about William Neven. And we're going to see who made all his work into a fantasy story and disconnected you from America by putting it, again, in this mythical place, just like Atlantis. And we're talking about Lemuria. On January 22, 1912, Neven received a letter from Camille Flammarion, former president and secretary general of the Societe Astronomique of France. Dear Sir, I have just read a brief account of the discovery which you have made of a city buried beneath the volcanic deposits of Mexico. Beneath, a city beneath the... Listen, all right? This question is all the more interesting to me as I am now collecting material for two works, one on volcanic eruptions and the other on the secular transformations of the surface of the globe. And I intend to make a special reference to your discovery. Uh, further on in the book... All right. It says here in Atska Pozalco back back there, he uh, actually uh, is doing more excavation. He is with another person uh, called A.E. Burke, papal representative, doctor of law and medicine and philosophy. All right. So he's there supervising, I guess. So it says Nevin invited Burke to visit his excavations at San Miguel Amantla, Atska Pozalco. 
So it says here, the excavation was 12 feet by 6 feet and 6 feet deep. They even had already dug up by 11 o'clock in the morning some valuable things, skulls, bones, pottery, and ornaments all placed on the side of the trench. Wanting a closer look at where the relics were coming from, the reverend jumped into the great ominous pit to scrutinize more closely the very latest findings. The earth is soft and friable, alluvial formations with stratifications of tepetate, clay-like porous rock and gravel and some ashes. Neven worked with his small pick's axe. Mexican workers at his side threw up shovelfuls of earth to clear the way. Here is an adult skull. I am just awaiting you to expose it. See, it is enclosed in an earthen vessel. Let's try to get it in its entirety. And then they also find an artifact says, this is a plebeian dish, he says, a common piece of pottery. But here is a bead which shows some distinction in its wearer. And here is an ivory needle. They even dug some more. Outlines of an incense burner emerged from the soil. Berg was impressed with the old Scott as he paused to explain the significance of each artifact as it was removed from the earth. Wonderful things are printed in this book, Neven declared. So this is the digging uh, excavation there at San Miguel Amatla, all right, in Astalcapalco, all right, in the Valley of Mexico. It says many of the small terracotta heads recovered by Neven had distinctive ethnic characteristics guys different phenotypes that's what i'm saying true old world burke was intrigued see this one purely phoenician or egyptian huh he looked phoenician oh he looked egyptian where's egypt we just did a video right this one mongolian or asian as they're saying right and this one ethiopian what do they mean so-called black oh ethiopian huh they were as anxious to delineate themselves as we are all right Listen, guys, I hope you understand what they were finding here and it proven. We've shown uh, these potteries, these stoneworks, these statues, these figurines with different phenotypes uh, and other uh, excavations in Mexico from other authors, from other scientists, archaeologists, art experts and all that, antiquarians, historians. And now you see in this side here, uh, William Niven is finding the same thing. They all have different phenotypes. This is how they're describing them. Of course, they're using these references. But you guys get the point. There wasn't just one phenotype here. They were overtaken by flood and destroyed. Others come in later, built on top of the old civilization. Listen, they were overtaken by a flood and destroyed. Are we talking about the great flood? Others come in later, built on top of the old civilization. They just built on top, just like today, right? The reset, huh? mud flood. For these people were civilized. And they too were destroyed by the awful eruptions of the volcanoes. See the lines of cement which mark the various floors. This is found anywhere in the Great Valley of Mexico. All over the Valley of Mexico, there's different layers of civilization. Senor Antina says he had recovered skulls, images, and stone and terracotta, incense burners, spindle whorls, bone needles, and jade beads. The day's finds were packed for transport to Neven's shop in the city, where they would be classified and recorded. Some would be given away to institutions or sold to cover the expenses of his modest operations. As the day ended, Burke mused over what he had seen. Here is the mystery. How did Egyptians, listen to this guy, then Africans get here. They're talking about phenotypes. They're not talking about actual Africans. They're talking about so-called Negro people with that phenotype, right? How did they get to Valley of Mexico? They're like, how? How is this possible if everything started in Africa or Asia? How is this possible? They can't figure it out, guys. But we know this is a true old world. That's why they just couldn't see it. They had to create so many stories and to try to conjecture so many ways. Instead of just realizing this is the true old world. It says here, the Mongolians may have come by the continental coast over the Great Strait of Bering. Was the lost Atlantis the bridge over which the Ethiopian and the Phoenician came? The Lord only knows. No, Phoenicians were here. This is Atlantis. All right, so this is amazing. This is people saying, this is Burke saying this, right? A different person. From what he's seeing, uh, Neven find. It says, Burke passed by three of the Noche Triste as he returned to the city through Tabuca and contemplated the flood of tears that Cortez shed there 400 years earlier, after a battle in which the Spaniards were defeated by the Aztecs, the remarkable past being recovered by Neven at Azcapotzalco was a kind of compensation he felt for losses suffered during that great tragedy. 
All right, so we're going to get to some uh, images here. So this is what they were saying they were finding. I mean, look at this one. It has an afro, so-called afro. You see that? <laughs> so they're saying a lot of different phenotypes and what they were finding. Remember, this is underneath layers of volcanic ash, like eruptions. They're saying very ancient, very old. All right, some more examples here. Here's a picture of William Niven. Uh, seated amongst some of the artifacts, it says. Here's some more uh, figurines, statues they have found. You know, this is all what he's finding. It says three images of Xochipili, god of flowers, all from San Juanico, Tabuca, Valley of Mexico, Andesite. All right, the god of flowers. A terracotta uh, vase, possible incense burner in form of a warrior, it says. And this one right here is a very popular artifact. I didn't know this was one of his findings. Uh, there is a book on her, something about her being Egyptian, you know, so-called ancient Egyptian. That was really over here. Just read a little. It says, stone sculpture of kneeling Chachiutlique, she of the jade skirt, the Aztec goddess of lakes, streams, and childbirth. And even found large quantities of jade beads, such as those depicted here throughout the Valley of Mexico. All right, very famous piece right here. Here's another incense burner. All right, we're talking about people having time to create these magnificent incense burners. A civilized man. And this is another great piece right here. Check it out. All right, you see that? Do you remember who you are? Seated terracotta figure of Chochi Pili, god of flowers with yellow coloring. The Teotihuacan influence is apparent in the max-like treatment of the face. The jewelry, especially the tassels on the headdress and knotted neck ornament, is distinctive. All right, very distinctive, meaning unique, ancient. This is what he found under layers, very old, from an ancient, ancient age. All right, some more uh, artifacts, figurines, statues uh, recovered by William Niven in his excavations here in mexico as, as you guys can see very interesting it says here representative tech paneca figurines recovered by neven in 1918 1919 and published by ramon mena in great archaeological discovery wow look at this it says here a little further ahead inscribed tablets and partition skulls 1921 1924 during october 1921 neven was digging at santiago ahuizotla a hamlet contiguous to San Miguel Amantla. About 14 feet from the surface, he came across an unusual dusted tablet covered with curious markings, the lines filled with red, yellow, and green pigment. It was so singular and startling that I commenced at once a systematic exploration of all the clay pits and tepetate quarries within an area of 20 square miles. Soon he discovered more of the tablets. They ranged in height from a few inches to nearly 30 inches. The finds fell into two categories. One category represented undetermined characters and perhaps early writing. The other possessed recognizable features such as human heads, animal figures, birds, reptiles, insects and plants, crosses, swastikas, solar signs, temple plants, land divisions and labyrinths or mazes. Word of the discovery soon spread in June 1923. Archaeologist Silvanus Morley, Franz Bloom, and Thomas Gann of the Carnegie Institute in Washington, D.C. visited Neven's shop on San Juan de Letran Street. Morley, who had studied under Professor Putnam at Harvard University, was noted for his work on Maya epigraphy. Morley, accompanied by Bloom and Gann, both men with a great passion for ancient Mesoamerica, was engaged in documenting the Maya city of Chichen Itza, they were stopping in Mexico City before proceeding to the Yucatan Peninsula. Morley commented that Neven had more actual archaeological objects than I have seen anywhere in Mexico, save only in the National Museum. These are real artifacts, guys. These are real. Morley wasn't sure that the tablets were genuine. In his opinion, they were simply too cruelly done to be real. Still, he conceded he digs out at Azcat Pozalco every Sunday. Most of his stuff is undoubtedly genuine. Undoubtedly genuine. It would be foolish to make fakes when the originals are so plentiful. Originals are so plentiful. Bloom blew off some paint of one of the figures. 
Morley agreed that it looked as if it were put on yesterday. Still, they felt that Niven was honest. The old man is bubbling over with enthusiasm. I cannot believe he could fake that all these years, all right? They're just amazed because you guys see what they're finding. They're like, no, it can't be. It can't be, and it's so deep. They're like, no, this is very, very ancient and very advanced. Just want to show some of these tablets, all right? There's many, many of them, all right? He found so many. Six shelf case of carved stone tablets in William Nevis, Mexico City shop. The first tablet was discovered in 1921. And here's some more, all right? Another image. As you guys can see, many, 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 many tablets, writings, inscriptions, pictoglyphs, some more uh, better angle right here. Representative tablets from the Valley of Mexico. All right, so returning to the story, uh, they're still doing excavations in front of Morley. It says about 200 yards distant was another hole. A yard below the surface of the ground was a flat slab of tepetate with one edge exposed. Morley carefully noted that the other edge passed under the earth where it had never been uncovered. All right, so he saw with his own eyes that this was not planted there. They actually dug this out. The piece exposed was at least nine feet long and a half as wide and its face had been covered with newspapers to protect it against the moisture. When they got there, the boys were busily engaged in rolling back the newspapers to uncover it. Morley was amazed that Pepe Tate was painted in red and yellow, similar to the colors he had seen on the questionable andesite tablets, except without any incising first. And even called the painting his sun god. The complete figure, counting its headdress, was perhaps six or seven feet high. Morley was convinced it would have been impossible to hoax the old man. All right? They couldn't hoax this. Gone took photographs of the painting. They saw similar pieces being uncovered at other locations within Neven's Dickens. Neven returned to work in the first trench while Morley and Gone looked on. Soon he unearthed a block of andesite about four inches high and one inch thick. It was painted red and yellow. Morley was stunned. There could be no doubt of the genuineness of this piece. He would later write in his diary, it came out of the bottom of the trench from undisturbed black earth and was still moist from the damp earth, all right? So again, eyewitness, remember Carnegie Institute and, he's, and Morley studied in Harvard, these accredited people. Morley cleaned off the block and picked the dirt out of the incised lines. They were filled with red and yellow pigment. Morley would later comment, it was a knockout, a perfect vindication of the old man. It couldn't have have come better if it had been planted, so it couldn't have have been planted. He only pays his boys 50 cents gold a day and 75 cents on Sundays, and they get nothing extra for whatever they find, which precludes their making these things to deceive Niven himself. There is too much work on them. Still not fully convinced, Morley and Gone ask Niven about where the other pieces had come from. All of the 200 odd pieces have come from within 200 yards of this trench, Niven replied not have ever been found elsewhere, either at the Pedregal de San Angel or Cummins Diggins at Tlapan, the hill of Cuicuilco, or even at Tozer and Hayes Diggins here at Atzalco. Although they were unlike anything Morley had ever seen in Mexico or anywhere else, to Morley's mind, the most recent find had finally authenticated these extraordinary remains, all right? This is authentic. Gone returned to Atzalco in early July, recovering more of the painted tepetate and incised andesite tablets under such conditions that their legitimacy as true antiques can no longer be disputed all right this is undisputable all right this is ancient it was dug up it's not a hoax morley had a moving picture of neva's excavations taken by the path agent roberto turbo he filmed the trenches and pits showing the altars with the men at work morley gone mena leaden with the large altar of the God of Fire clearly in view, once edited the Path News moving picture titles included William Neven excavating at Aztec Palace beneath the city of Mexico, idols found by William Neven, and skulls found by William Neven. Neven hoped that Morley would get the Carnegie Institute to furnish funds to have the central altar, a monster slab of the Tepe Tate measuring 7 feet by 5 feet by 16 inches, weighing over a ton, 
removed to the National Museum in Mexico City, where it properly belonged. The distance to the museum was five miles, and all preparations had been made to have a special parihuela stretcher constructed for the transport of the slab, carried by a squad of sturdy peons. Unfortunately, Morley was called away to Yucatan, all right? But they didn't let him do that, and the plan had to be abandoned. Neven filled in the trench with the same earth that had been taken out of it, and the land reverted to its former use as a cornfield. Do you guys hear that? They just threw it back and buried it, and it's a cornfield. They were like, okay, we can't do nothing about it. So it's still there, and it's been hidden. They never told us about this. You see that? Four of the inscribed andesite tablets associated with what many archaeologists called subpedregal or archaic pottery, archaic, all right, old, were published by Gahn in an article in the Illustrated London News, the oldest civilization on the American continent for October 6, 1923. Gahn estimated that the volcano that produced the lava flow covering the sub-Pedregal remains, including the inscribed stone tablets, probably erupted between 3,000 and 5,000 years ago. Probably, I right? could be older thereby preserving remains of the first civilization in the Mexican Valley, if not on the American continent, okay? Gone would include a discussion of the tablets in his 1936 book, Mexico, from the earliest times to the conquest. William L. Stitcher, a reporter for Henry Ford's Dearborn Independent, also visited Neven's Dick during the summer of 1923. The inscribed stone tablets were of special interest, because they had been recovered in a relatively restricted zone. It became commonplace to refer to them as a 7,000-year-old library. Again, a 7,000-year-old library from the Valley of Mexico. Stiger interviewed Neven at Azcapotzalco. How old would you say the library is? At least 7,000 years old, and possibly 10,000. We know that the volcanic deluge came about 5,000 years ago, for we can measure that by the various strata that are above the volcanic debris. This entire valley was a great volcanic cone with 50 active volcanic mountains, and at least three of these giants constantly threw out streams of lava and ash and fire which inundated this valley like a great flood. It was at that inundation that this prehistoric library was covered. The books are tablets just as the books of the libraries of ancient peoples have always been, okay? It's the same thing, just like the ones they find over there talking about Sumerian tablets. All right, these are tablets, ancient, older most likely. These tablets are of all sizes. They have their writings on five sides of a stone. Some of the books are crude and some of them show a high degree of stone book making skills. Neven talked on about the range of symbols found on the tablets and their possible symbolism the sun, fire, water. It was evident from the stone engravings, he went on, that the oldest of the Mexican deities was the god of fire. Mythical animals appear in this library, and they are always connected with the fire and sun signs. Smoke is always represented by upward curling rays. Stiger was also impressed with the ethnic types represented. All right, He was also like, wow, there was a lot of phenotypes here, here in ancient America. So again, he was also impressed with the ethnic types represented by the pottery figurines recovered by Neven. He has studied hundreds of diminutive clay heads. The Chinese have always been adventuring people, he wrote. With the pioneering instinct and the evidence is overwhelming that they thronged this Mexican plateau 10,000 years ago in vast armies, influencing its civilization to this day. All right, vast armies 10,000 years ago in Mexico? The Egyptian influence is apparent in every shovel of relics unearthed by the excavators, all right? You hear that? Egyptian influence, meaning things that look like ancient Egypt. But this is ancient Egypt right here. He's seeing it in reverse. So he's saying, in every pyramid uncovered, in every piece of sculpture, and every carving on every idol, that Africa also contributed its imprint to the civilizations of the Mexican plateau seems certain. And remember, guys, you got to dodge the hijack because the only reason he's saying Africa is because they're finding Negroid, Negroid, as he's going to say, you'll see, influence, dodge the hijack. That doesn't mean they were coming from Africa. In the faces of the unearthed idols, 
and on the carving of the stones, the Negroid influence is felt at every turn, all right? There were so-called Negroes here already in the Americas, in ancient America. Stiger continued his questioning of Niven. One discovery of particular interest was an unusual series of skulls with a distinct partition of hard bone running from the under surface of the skull inward. Dig at the skull and tamper into a fine point the farther in toward the brain matter it extends. On some of the skulls, the partition was as much as three quarters of an inch deep. From which of these layers of earth do the partition skulls come, Stiger asked, from the deepest known volcanic ash strata? which means the oldest civilization that we know in Mexico. And even explained that he had shown the partition skulls to Dr. L.H. Dudley Buxton, a professor of human anatomy at Oxford University, one of the foremost experts on prehistoric skulls in the world. All right, this guy is famous. Buxton hadn't seen anything like them elsewhere. And you see what he said? They're unique. They're unique. They're not like the other prehistoric bones you've seen. How many of these have you unearthed? several hundred and we're finding them every day so these people with divided skulls are the people who built the greatest pyramids on this earth and developed a high type of culture 2000 years before christ this unearthing of a race with partition skulls is my greatest contribution to scientific discovery niven declared buxton presented the results of his study of 26 skulls found in the third cultural level at azcapotzalco at the 1924 annual meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science held in Toronto. The paper was controversial. Buxton reported that the Toltecs were forerunners of the Aztecs, example, probably northerners. But Neven's skulls are clearly Maya in type, all right? They're Maya, who's the ancient Nagas. We'll see. Uh, here we have a seated uh, figure, as it says uh, down below, uh, with knees pulled up volcanic rock 13 inches in height from Tamos district of Panuco Veracruz another artifact uh, found by William Niven all right as you guys can see it's a uh, stone plaque with horned owl and Huehueteot the old old god we have some terracotta jars one in squash or gourd shape the latter 11 inches in diameter from Tamos district of Panuco Veracruz all right a uh, volcanic stone mortar with carved decorations of twin rattlesnakes all right again from Veracruz Another tablet here with an inscription. A typical example of Niven's Valley of Mexico tablets discussed by George R. Fox at the 1924 American Anthropological Association meeting in Springfield, Illinois. All right. All right, so about page 237 of this book, we go on to the part where it's going to relate to the bonus uh, video I'm going to show you guys today. And it says here, the lost continent of Mu. From 1927 and 1928 all right how does this all relate a lot of you guys know who james uh Shershward is if not we're gonna uh, learn today it says here in august george collinson a longtime friend and fellow american expatriate who had lived a number of years in mexico wrote neven from new york city he had just seen a very remarkable book the lost continent of mu listen the lost continent of mu like queen mu right by colonel james Churchward. The book contained a chapter on Niven's buried cities with a good deal of praise for the important tablets he had excavated. Collinson wondered if Niven had Churchward's address. Niven responded to Collinson's letter on the 13th. He didn't know Churchward or his work. All right. So this is something very important. I want to emphasize you guys. Uh, William Niven found out that this guy, James Churchward, the guy who wrote the famous story of Lemuria, about the snake people, Nagas and all that, the lost continent of, of Mu. We're gonna see later on what book we're gonna read from that book. He found out he had written this book and included his findings and everything without even asking him. He didn't even know him. I haven't seen Lost Continent of Mu. And if you will kindly send me the publisher's name, I will write for a copy. Since moving to Tampico, he hadn't excavated in the Valley of Mexico due to government restrictions. Still, he had over 15,000 Valley of Mexico objects in the Neven Museum in Tampico, including more than 2,000 of the stone tablets. Collison visited the publishers on Fifth Avenue in New York City, purchased a copy of The Lost Continent of Mu, and sent it to Neven in Tampico. He also forwarded Churchward's Mount Vernon, New York address. These were received in early September. Neven was optimistic yet cautious. I have already looked over it for a couple of hours. With much pleasure, 
and even wrote to Collison upon receipt of the Churchward book. The scientists may not accept many of his theories, but it ought to have a wide circulation amongst archaeologists in general. Who will find it most interesting? The chapter on even Mexican buried cities appears through the great courtesy and kindness of the Dearborn Independent, Dearborn Mitch, Henry Ford's paper, notwithstanding many inaccuracies, will help to sell my very cities of Mexico. Even though it has inaccuracies, he's letting you know, this is William Niven, when I'm able to have it published. So he was like, you know, I think it's good publicity for me, even though it has many inaccuracies. So Niven in, uh, was writing back and forth to Church, uh, Churchward and say, hey, I read your book. Thanks for including me, all this stuff, right? But Niven was warning people, says here, Niven suggested caution and accepting Churchward's theories without reserve all right a lot of theories james church was added to that made it into like a whole fantasy disconnecting you from america his wonderful imagination and the accumulation of evidence from any source to prove his pet belief in the destruction of Mu, his pet belief all right and his reckless extravagance in computing dates must make the judicious grief never put in Notwithstanding, some of my friends think that he may have paved the way for the correct deciphering of my carved tablets. Fox was touched by Neiman's dedication to the task. Only one thing detracts from my pleasure in reading The Lost Continent of Mu, and that is the knowledge of the immense amount of work you are putting into the making of the copy. Not only the written material of the book, but the illustrations as well. This is the ideal way to read a book, have a certain number of pages come to you each day. I am reading the book slowly and with understanding. At first, Fox was a little impressed. Churchward was too dogmatic and made too many definite statements, which had no proof back of them, all right? There's no proof of many things he wrote in there. That's what I've been trying to tell you. This is something I pointed out in the video that I'm going to show you guys. But as he read further, there is very much of interest. It is interesting, though, right? That's why people liked it. Niven agreed with Collison that it was great luck to have come across a man like Churchward. Churchward had first gone to India over 50 years before, during a famine to assist in relief efforts. While there, he discovered a dozen ancient tablets covered with glyphs. With the assistance of some high priests, in two years, Churchward succeeded in deciphering the tablets. The symbols referred to a lost continent in the Pacific Ocean called Mu, all right? This is deep right here, guys. Think about that. So you're in Asia, right? And they're talking about from people in ancient Asia saying, hey, there's a continent in the Pacific Ocean, this lost continent, this land called Mu. Well, if you're in Asia and you go on the Pacific and you keep going east, you're eventually going to end up where? In the Americas, all right? In the Americas, so-called Mu. Churchward then dedicated much of the next 50 years of his life to exploring the islands of the Pacific, Central America, and Mexico, searching for clues to the existence of the lost continent. Because the Nakal tablets of Burma and India were similar to Niven's Valley of Mexico finds, they were similar. Niven felt that it may neutralize the cruel prejudices against me by the American Museum of Natural History. He used that to legitimize himself because he had some wild theories, guys. In early 1928, Churchward gave a radio talk, Prehistoric America, on WNYC in New York City. Among other topics, Churchward discussed William Neven and his important discoveries in the Valley of Mexico. The publicity was encouraging, so Neven sent Churchward an additional 200 drawings and some photographs for possible inclusion in his forthcoming colonies of Mu. All right, so you see, even William Neven is, you know, helping him create uh, his book because he's like, hey, I'm, he, this guy's giving me publicity. He's the only one really paying attention to me. He's looking at he's doing interviews in New York and the radio. They're kind of using each other. But I want to start pointing out right away, guys. These archaeological finds in Mexico is legitimizing James Churchward's Lemuria theory. But this is in Mexico. You're going to see that that's the only thing he has. Oren cautioned Niven not to go too strong on the colonel. The only really interesting part of the book was the description of your own excavations. That's the only real part. That's what I'm saying. That's the actual facts. He used William Niven's excavation. And that's the only interesting part of his book. This was, so that was just a little history that we didn't have in my uh, old video. Uh, you know, another perspective from this book about uh, Neven's uh, relationship with Churchward. But literally, Churchward kind of used William Neven's uh, dig to make himself rich and famous and, and spread his theories more in his book. 
It says here, uh, way ahead in the book, legacy, like this is at the end of the book. It says here, if Niven is remembered today, it is usually through his inadvertent association with James Churchward. Niven's book about his explorations in Mexico never saw the light of day. By way of contrast, by February 1946, Churchward's lost continent of Mu had gone through 14 printings. All right, he made his money, but William uh, Niven, who actually did all the work, he didn't even print his book. With the burgeoning occultist movement of the late 1960s, occultist Churchward's entire Mu series was reissued in paperback form. All right, so he even made more money in the 60s because of the occultist. There was even a spurious volume about Niven's excavations, Mu revealed by Tony Earle, an anagram for Not Really, published in the same series. Yet there was much more to William Niven than the problematic Valley of Mexico tablets promoted by the eccentric Churchward. Certainly, it should be emphasized that scholars need to go beyond Churchward's pronouncements, okay? So basically, James Churchward kind of made his findings seem like it was a little fake because he wasn't a very credited person and he was giving wild theories in his Lemuria book. So they're telling you right here, it should be emphasized that scholars need to go beyond Churchward's pronouncements about the tablets and examine Niven's own collection of 2,600 rubbins of tablets from the Valley of Mexico, all right, 2,600 with complete sight and stratigraphic information, which deserves fuller attention that it has received to date, all right? James Churchward actually messed up the image and he used William Niven and he created this whole fantasy story about Lemuria. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you. Niven's work in the state of Guerrero, although somewhat superseded by more recent developments in the field has never been duplicated. There has been no systematic attempt to identify the nearly 100 Olmec, Mezcala, Chochipala and related sites worked by Niven between 1891 and 19. 10. All right, you guys hear this? This is very ancient people. His collections of Guerrero artifacts today housed in a half a dozen museums, detailed field notes and diaries, and extensive archaeological photographs, some taken more than a century ago, await careful study and eventual publication. All right, it hasn't even been published. All these uh, tablets, you know, in detail and good quality. And this is the story of William Neven, all right? That's why I wanted to read this book so you guys can understand why I did that Lemuria uh, video. All right, so now we got to the uh, bonus part of this video. We're going to do a little throwback. We're going to go over this remastered uh, version of this video right here. As you see, Lemuria in Mexico, William Neven's lost discovery, 50,000 years old civilization, Nagas, Nakal, all right? So let's see what this is about. Again, this is an older video. This is before I had this book we read today. So now we're just going to combine it. Hope you guys enjoyed this uh, bonus video. It's about another 40 minutes. And you're going to see how James Churchward just totally used uh, William Niven to make himself famous. And you're going to see that he literally used all his work to create his Lemuria book. Some things they found in Mexico, all right? In Mexico, in the Americas. Yes. The Americas has a Pacific. We are on the Pacific, yes. All right, so let's get to it. Let's go ahead and watch the video. Or called Queen Mu and the Egyptian Finx. This is written by Augustus Le Plojon, MD. He did some archaeological work there in the Yucatan. Very, um, very scholarly. Actually, he did a lot of research. He has a lot of sources in his book. Again, this was written in 1896. Just want to go ahead and read sign here. We're going to continue in this book. In the appendix are presented for the first time in modern ages the cosmogonic notions of the ancient Mayas, rediscovered by me. They will be found identical with those of the other civilized nations of antiquity. In them are embodied many of the secret doctrines communicated in their initiations to the adepts in India, Chaldea, Egypt, and Samotrasia. The origin of the worship of the cross. Okay, again future video i'm going to show you where the cross originated and he just correlated with it and i didn't know he was going to correlate with that but again the origin of the worship of the cross or the commemorance or what the cross was right not a worship of that of the tree or the tree of life and of the serpent the khan's plum serpent introduced in india by the nagas 
who? The Nagas. This was introduced in India by the Nagas, who raised such a magnificent temple in Cambodia. The Nagas raised a temple in Cambodia. Who are these Nagas? In the city of Angkor Thom, to their god, the seven-headed serpent, the Akshapat of the Mayas. The same god of the Mayas, which is called Akshapat. And afterward carried its worship to Akkad and to Babylon. So what? We're talking about the Nagas? Who was these Nagas? They had brought this serpent knowledge from America, right? To Cambodia, from there to Akkad and to Babylon. So we've seen a reverse direction. And these cosmogonic notions, we also find the reason why the number 10 was held most sacred by all civilized nations of antiquity and why the Mayas, who in their scheme of numeration adopted the decimal system, did not reckon by tens, but by fives and twenties, and why they used the 20 millionth part of half the meridian as standard of lineal measures. In the following pages, I simply offer to my readers the relation of certain facts. I have learned from the sculptures, the monumental inscriptions carved on the walls of the ruined palaces of the Mayas, the record of which is likewise contained in such of their books as have reached us. I venture only such explanations as will make clear their identity with the conceptions on the same subjects of the wise men of India, Chaldea, Egypt, and Greece. All right. I do not ask my readers to accept a priori of my own conclusions, but to follow the sound advice contained in the Indian saying quoted at the beginning of this preface. All right. Verify by experience what you have learned. Then only then form your own opinion. All right, so we continue in the book, The Lost Continent of Mu by Colonel James Churchward, 1931. And I'm on page 113, wanted to read this part to you. More correlation to what we're you know learning. It says, now I shall try to fix an appropriate date of the Naga colony in India before it became a colonial empire. All right, so a colony. One prominent figure in the Naga or Maya Empire in India. So this Naga Empire is really the Maya Empire in India. It's a colony of the Maya. So it says that one prominent figure of this Naga or Maya Empire in India was Prince Maya. Yes, Prince Maya. They had a prince. His name was Maya. The time of Prince Maya is doubtful. Although I have come across many records about him. Not a single one even estimates the day when he lived, but according to traditions, and these traditions are as plentiful as leaves on a tree, Prince Maya lived 15,000 to 20,000 years ago in Ramayana or in the Ramayana. All right, that's a book, an ancient Hindu book of poems or stories or something like that. All right, we find this reference to him. In olden times, there was a prince of the Nagas whose name was Maya of the serpent kings, of the Nagas. Who's the serpent kings again? The Mayas, right? His name was Maya. Prince Maya was the author of the Surya Siddhanta, the hoariest treatise on astronomy in India. Its age has been variously estimated at from 10,000 to 22,000 years. At the time of Prince Maya, the Nagas were an empire. When the handle and shove of this knife were made, the Nagas were a colony antedating the empire. That they were only colonies clearly shown by the suns without rays on the horizon. This proves the extreme antiquity of the handle and the sheep. All right. And this is what they're talking about. This knife and handle. The Naga Hindu knife, they call it. It is not known when the Naga Empire ended. But they're saying that this is very old. Before their empire was established. When they were just colonies coming from America. So what is the Ramayana? It says the Ramayana is an ancient Indian epic composed sometime in the 5th century BC about the exile and then return of Rama, prince of Ajodhya. All right, so we're in ancient history encyclopedia. All right. It was composed in Sankras by the sage Valmiki. All right, so this was written by this guy named Valmiki, who's known as famous sage. All right, the Ramayana. Valmiki was a great sage and author of the Ramayana. So 
says, from Maharsha Balmiki, the author of the great Indian epic of Ramayana, was a Hindu sage who lived around the beginning of the first millennium BC. He is referred to as the Adi Kavi, the original creator of the Hindu slok, a verse form in which most of the great epics, such as the Ramayana, the Magah Bharata, Puranas, and other works are composed, all right? He started that, all right? So he's going to read this book over here. And we're in the book here. It's called Garden of the Elder Gods by Don Shom or Shkom. All right, and just reading right here. There's an overview of such regional centers will commence within Asia, where one of the early academies was evidently located in ancient Burma, modern-day Mayan. According to the Indian historian Valmiki, I all right, here we go, Valmiki, right? An Indian historian who's a real sage, a real historian. All right, Burma was the first settlement in Asia, with some records supposedly dating its cultural start around 33,000 BC. All right, they can go that back, all right, according to them, right? Records from other diverse cultures state that the extensive instruction was dispensed throughout Burma prior to its dispersal into other lands. Such graduates eventually migrated eastward into China and southeastward into Thailand and Cambodia, as well as westward into an uninhabited part of Northwest India. All right, so they're going to tell us what they're talking about when they're talking about these graduates. It says, in those areas, human graduates and a few helpers that accompanied them taught human natives they encountered. Those regional teachers became known as the Nagas, all right, the Nagas. Certain ancient tablets found in Burma have been directly linked with Naga records found within India. Writings by Balmiki expressly stated, now listen to what Balmiki said, the author of the Ramayana, all right? Listen to what he stated. It says, the Maya, starting from the land of their birth in the East, right, in America, they went first to Burma and there taught the natives who became known as the people of the Nagas. All right, you see what's going on here? You see the correlation? The original indigenous culture of India is thought to be that of the Danavas, the Nagas, who were later called the Nakals, and still later became known as the Maya, all right? They later became known as the Maya, reportedly imparted that culture. It was the Nagas who started this whole Indian or Hindu stan or Hindu uh, mythology, culture, and history. However, Colonel Churchward claimed that the original or earliest people were actually the Maya. All right? He taught the right thing, which was the Maya. Perhaps a reference to the ancient ones or the pure-blooded, human-like lunar petries that comprise a group known as the Helpers. Valmiki further claimed that the Naga came to be called the Maya in certain later settlements. So even these Maya, these Nagas were called Maya in India. All right, you hear that? Accounting for the overall confusion of the chronological order of introduction between the Naga, the Navas, Nakals, and Maya. They're probably all the same people. Some records resolve this linguistic dispute by referring to the earliest civilizers as the Naga Maya. The Naga Maya, all right? There are further indications, although inconclusive, that the Naga Maya may have also been associated with the Mayans of Mesoamerica, all right? They are the Mayans of Mesoamerica. Where else would they get the word from? Ancient records indicate that the original Naga Maya were associated with the serpent people. The what? Serpent people. Again, we were reading earlier, right, in the book Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids, right? Origin of the Maya, what did it tell us? All right, the book of Chilambalan relates that the first inhabitants of Yucatan were the Chinese people of the serpent, all right? It's some a serpent of the east, all right? The Chumal book of Chilambalan is even more specific. It speaks of the first inhabitants of Yucatan known as the Akanle, or people of the serpent, people of the serpent. I right, will go back to Garden of the Elder Gods. All right, the other book we were reading, it says, again, ancient records indicate that the original Naga Maya were associated with the serpent people, the snake kings, the Nagas. What up, my Naga? The esoteric non-human race of wondrous beings, esoteric non-human, so they want to make it all mythical, right? That report, reportedly possessed immense cosmic wisdom 
The serpent symbol was one of the ancient icons specifically referring to the ancient ones. You see, that's you they're talking about, the ancient ones. Hence, the Naga emblem became the serpent or cobra symbol of ancient India, one revered as signifying both great wisdom and immense knowledge. And you find that in Egypt too, right? Now, back to what the Rama Jana was telling us and what we were reading in the other book, right? It was saying that, about Prince Maya, right? It says one of the prominent Naga Empire leaders was the original Prince Maya, right? This is in their Hindu text, Prince Maya. He came from another land with a later namesake or counterpart also existing during much later times. No written record established a time frame for the original prince, but oral traditions place him as living sometime between 18,000 and 13,000 BC. The Ramayana merely refers to the original Prince Maya as living in the olden times. Original people from the olden times. That original prince is credited as the true source of most of the esoteric knowledge of India. All right, he was a Maya, he was an American, a Naga. All right, he passed the knowledge over to the Hindus over there, or the native people over there. All right, passed down over the ages, which was later contained in the Surya Seed Hanta. All right, all that that he taught, Prince Maya was written right there in that book. Or called Queen Mu and the Egyptian Finx. This is written by Augustus Le Plojon. Perhaps also will be felt the necessity of recovering the libraries of the Maya sages hidden about the beginning of the Christian era to save them from destruction at the hands of the devastating hordes that invaded their country in those times and to learn from their contents the wisdom of those ancient philosophers of which that preserved in the books of the Brahmins is but the reflection. You hear that? So all these books of the Brahmins in Hindustan is just a reflection of the old knowledge of the Mayas. And to learn from their contents the wisdom of those ancient philosophers of which that preserved in the books of the Brahmins is but the reflection. All right, so these books of the Brahmins in Hindustan or India is just a reflection of the um, you know, Maya uh, history or stories or knowledge. All right, that wisdom was no doubt brought to India. Again, that wisdom was no doubt, no doubt brought to India and from there carried to Babylon and Egypt. So it went from America to India and his, you know, based on what he's reading to Babylon and Egypt in very remote ages by those Maya adepts, Nakal, Nakal, the exalted, who starting from the land of their birth as missionaries of religion and civilization went to Burma, where they became known as the Nagas, demonizing serpents, right? But we're talking about the snake kings, the Khans, the Nagas, the Mayas, the plum serpent, the Khans, priest kings, we're talking about the dragon kings, right? Not all snakes are bad, just like not all angels are good. Thanks to King Drop for that drop. All right. So again, they went to Burma, the Maya, where they became known as the Nagas, and they established themselves in the Deccan, whence they carried their civilizing work all over the earth. Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids, again by Peter Tompkins. All right, so now we are on part 25. It's called Prehistoric Mexico. All right, and I want to read this part. We read from a book a little bit, uh, Mu, The Lost Continent. That was uh, written by James Churchward. I want to read a little bit of the story behind that book, though. All right, so it's in this book, Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramid. So it says, one indication that a far earlier civilization existed in the Valley of Mexico than was reached by Manuel Gamio Spades comes from the tantalizing discoveries made in the Mexican highlands by a Scotsman. William Neven, as a mining engineer working for a Mexican corporation, Neven described coming upon the remains of two separate prehistoric civilizations at depths from 6 to 30 feet below the present level of the Valley of Mexico. All right? He found a whole city, town, ruins, 30 feet below the Valley of Mexico. All right? That's how far he found it. That's how deep. So dig on William Neven, all right? 
These discoveries made between 1910 and 1930 have hardly been considered by the scientific world, partly because they fit into none of the preconceived notions. Right? It doesn't fit into their out of Africa or theories and, or, and all that stuff, right? Mesopotamia and all that. And partly because they were used by an even more unorthodox author, James Churchward. All right, so it seems that this author, James Churchward, somehow knew William Neven, got the info, and wrote his own book about it. All right, what this guy found, William Neven, but based on what he believed, his belief. All right, so it says he used it to validate his, to them, to the or, um, you know orthodox scientific scientists, his even wilder hypothesis: the existence of a vast continent in the Pacific Ocean, which he called Mu, Mother says he, of several colonial civilizations which spread around the globe. All right, so real quick, this is what they're talking about that uh, James Churchward uh, wrote, which is The Lost Continent of Mu, which we read a little bit earlier. Fantastic, but true, the scientific mythical discovery of a strange civilization that disappeared 50,000 years ago. Intensely interesting. All right, so James Churchward, right? So this is the book. But he got a lot of his studies from... And so it says here, dedicated to my friend, William Neven. So I guess that was his friend, suppose, by whose help and discoveries I have been able to bring to fruitation this work. So you see, he, was in, he wouldn't have been able to write this book if uh, William Neven hadn't made that discovery and shared the info with him somehow. So it says, prefix. All matters of science in this work are based on the translations of two sets of ancient tablets. Nakal tablets, which we already know are the Nagas, which are the Mayas, right? which I discovered in India many years ago, and a large collection of stone tablets over 2,500 recently discovered by William Neven in Mexico. So he used the Nagas tablets or the ancient Mayas tablets, and he used other ancient me uh, uh, people of Mexico or Aboriginal, uh, you know, tablets that were found in Mexico. So, you know, he's using all our work, all our history, basically. Both sets have the same origin. You heard that? Both sets have the same origin. Both sets are extracts from the sacred inspired writings of Mu, what he calls Mu, right? Mu is Lemuria, Atlantis, America. It's all this place. It was here. Not all of it sent. The Nakal tablets are written with the Naga symbols and characters, and legend says were written in the motherland and first brought to Burma and then to India. Their extreme age is attested to by the fact that history says the Nakals left Burma more than 15,000 years ago. All right, so now you see how James Churchward is saying that it, um, these tablets, these Naga symbols, were first brought from the motherland. We just read before, right, what Balmiki told us, right? Balmiki, let's go back. Again, in the Garden of the Elder Gods book we just read, right, what did Balmiki tell us specifically? That the Maya, starting from the land of their birth in the east, which was America, right, the Maya, went first to Burma and there taught the natives who became known as the people of the Nagas, all right? So it was the Maya, it wasn't Omu, all right? So let's go back to what, uh, so James Churchward has taken the narrative, right? And uh, he's not giving credit to Valmiki. He's straight up saying that the Naga symbols, right, were written in the motherland or the place of birth we got in the other book, right? Which was the East with the Maya, right? That was the motherland and first brought to Burma, then to India. So when they're talking about motherland, Mu, gosh, the hijack talking about the true birth of the Maya, the land of the Maya, true America. So it says, where the Mexican tablets were written is problematical. They are mostly written in the Northern or Igor symbols and characters. What actual writing there is on both sets is in the alphabet of Mu, motherland. Whether they were written in Mexico or in the motherland and brought to Mexico, I cannot say. You see, he doesn't know whether they were written in the motherland. What motherland? He keeps saying Mu. It's an imagination place for him, but you know we know Mu is part of an ancient land or that was connected to America. It had something to do with the also the original people that were coming out of America, right? But he's telling you straight up here he doesn't know whether it was in Mexico or the motherland. He can't say, right? They are, however, over twelve thousand years old, as shown by some of the tablets. All right, so that's just the story I wanted you to you know if you get into this book, it's really good, but because he goes into what he found. But let's go back to uh, Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids that they were talking about, James Churchward and William Neven's uh, story. So it says, Churchward's efforts, though very popular with aficionados of Atlantean and Lemurian tales, 
and often prophetically exact in certain details, have because of churchwards unsupported and highly improbable notions, he doesn't have you know, supported evidence, been thrown out by an establishment which may have discarded along with churchwards Lemurian bathwater some living screaming babies. So you hear that? So even though he was making some of it up or just trying to fit his narrative, he was getting a lot of true information, a lot of real historic, archaeological, real um, scientific research that uh, William was finding. And because of his crazy, uh, that wasn't fitting with what the establishment wanted at that time, they were throwing out babies. The babies were screaming, saying there was information here that we could have used. So all that got lost because of his wild theories, supposedly. So being befriended by his fellow Freemason, church word was of no greater help to William Neven. So he was a Freemason, you see that? And he took church with, uh, William's work and he made his own book. He probably made millions of that during that time for writing that book, Move. All right, so he didn't help William Neven at all. Then it had been to Le Plongeon. So he didn't help Le Plongeon because we're going to get into his book and William Neven. Uh, he didn't help either of them, Churchward, except that with the thousands of copies Churchward books sold around the world, Neven was rescued from oblivion. So we wouldn't even know about Neven, William, right? If at least Churchward wouldn't have wrote about him. So at least he did sign so we can remember what happened. When he died in 1937, his obit in the American Historical Review listed him merely as a professor who had been engaged for several years in mineralogical research, an honorary life member of the American Museum of Natural History, and various other such scientific societies who had become involved in Mexican archaeology, nothing more. Nothing to indicate he might have made the most controversial archaeological discovery of the Western world. All right, so his work, what he found in 1910, 1930s, William Neven in Mexico, which um, James Churchford took and made a book called Mu, The Lost Continent, even though this stuff was found in Mexico. I want you to understand that. All right. His work is not known. He's not known in, in our textbooks. We don't know nothing about this guy, all right? It was on purpose. He found something very controversial. Actually, Neven had been exploring in Mexico since 1889, while digging among the ancient ruined cities in the unknown and uninhabited portion of the state of Guerrero, southwest of Mexico City in, in the Acapulco area. He began to receive periodic visits from local Indians who came to him with terracotta figurines and other objects for sale. Though the Indians pretended to have found these objects at the Pyramid of the Sun and Moon at San Juan Teotihuacan, Niven realized that the source of the artifacts must be nearer. With a bribe of five pesos, which is two, two and a half dollars at that time, he managed to discover the actual spot between Texcoco and Cujaluepantla, hamlets just north of Mexico City. He became across, he came across hundreds, if not thousands, of pits dug into the sand, clay, and tepetate used for material by builders of Mexico City for more than 300 years, exploring these pits, which Neven says cover an area of about 10 by 20 miles in the northwest corner of the Valley of Mexico, he came across vast layers of what appeared to be very ancient ruins, whole prehistoric cities lying as deep as 30 feet below the plain, which appeared to have been overwhelmed by a series of cataclysmic tidal waves. Uh, you hear what this, what's going on here? They found what he found. He found ruins buried 30 feet below the ground. Obvious something happened there, right? Cataclysm. Uh, perhaps at several thousand year intervals, which, as Neven described them, had left te telltale strata of boulders, sand, and pebbles by their depth beneath the surface. Neven estimated the oldest remains might go as far back as 50,000 years. All right? Now remember... In the past videos and the other parts of this series, we got Graham Hancock telling us they've been hiding a hundred thousand years of history here in America. There's a proof of a hundred thousand years of occupation in the Amazon. All right, so what are we, you know, what's going on here, right? What are we really finding out? This is the true old world, right? Look at everything that they've hidden from us. Four to six feet below the first pavement, even says he encountered a second concrete floor. But in the intervening space, failed to find a single piece of pottery or other trace to indicate that humans had once lived here. Beneath the second pavement, he describes coming upon what he considered the great find of many, many years' work in Mexican archaeology. Neven discerned beneath a well-defined layer of ashes from two to three feet thick, analyzed as being of volcanic origin, 
traces of innumerable buildings, large but regular in size, the remains of a vast city which appeared uniformly at the same level throughout more than a hundred clay pits, and one of the houses, most of which were crushed and ruined, filled with ashes and debris, he says he found an arched wooden door which had turned to stone. The walls of, his ho of this house were bound together with, with white cement, harder than stone itself. In one uncrushed room, about 30 feet square, full of volcanic ash with a flat roof of concrete and stone, Neven says he came across many artifacts and human bones, which crumbled to the touch like a slaked lime. According to his detailed report, a complete goldsmith's outfit was still on the floor with some 200 models of figures and idols modeled in clay turned to stone, each model thickly coated with iron oxide, bright and yellow, presumably there to prevent the molten metals adhering to the patterns while in the casting pot. Neven says the ornaments were unlike any found in Palenque or Mitla or anywhere between. The work was fine, beautifully polished, demonstrating an advanced degree of civilization. On the walls, Neven found paintings in red, blue, yellow, green, and black, which he says compared favorably with the best he had seen from Greek, Etruscan, or Egyptian works of a similar sort. The ground color of the wall was a pale blue, six inches down from the 14-foot ceiling. A frieze painted in dark red and black ran around the room glazed with some native wax which had perfectly preserved the color and pattern which depicted the life of some person apparently a shepherd from birth to death continuing the book it says then in 1921 it, we're still talking about william neven and his uh, discovery there in mexico in the course of excavations at santiago Ajuizotla, a hamlet contiguous to amantla about five miles northwest of mexico city Neven came across a discovery so startling, he says it opened up for him a whole new field of archaeological research. At a depth of 12 feet, Neven described coming across the first of a series of stone tablets with very unusual pictographs, systematically exploring other clay pits and tepitate quarries within an area of 20 square miles. He claimed he was able to unearth during the course of the next two years, 975 more tablets in the end, he says he found more than 2,600, though there was nothing in these tablets by which he could determine their exact or even approximate age, and even deduced from the depth of which they were buried and the accumulation of debris on top of them that they were over 12,000 years old and more likely closer to 50,000 years old. I just want to show you. All right, this the picture of these tab uh, artifacts that he found, these tablets. All right, he found so many. It says Neven showcase number six containing a portion of his collection of carved stones from the Valley of Mexico. When William Neven died in August, uh, Austin, Texas, in 1937, the New York Times described him as a distinguished mineralogist and archaeologist who had discovered buried prehistoric cities beneath the Valley of Mexico. He was also noted as the discoverer of four new minerals, including citralite, torogon, and nevenite. According to the Times, Neven donated to the Mexican government the best of the relics he found in Mexico, keeping for himself some which he sold to finance further archaeological expeditions. With what was later, with what was left over, there were enough pieces to establish in Mexico City a private museum of 30,000 exhibits. You hear this? How come we don't know about this? All right. All right, so I just wanted to go back to an illustration that was here in the book that I didn't show you guys. So I guess this is the uh, the death of what he found, the ruins, the buried city. All right, so it tells you, I guess this will be the top, right? The land level. And then it says here, one foot of earth. And then right here it says nine feet of boulders, gravel, sand, drogues, pottery. And then it says first pavement. Six feet of small boulders, gravel, and sand. Then it says second pavement, right? And then it says 14 feet of small boulders, gravel, sand. Then right here it says volcanic ashes. And then it says buried city, the third pavement. Neven's Mexican buried cities, now 7,000 feet above level of sea. Mountains 5,000 feet higher intervening. 
in the several strata clearly revealed by the pits and even says he found traces of what he describes as three well-preserved concrete floors or pavements of at depths from about six to 25 feet. Above the first pavement, there was a deposit of small boulders, pebbles and sands covered with a foot thick coating of rich valley soil. Everywhere in the first layer of debris, Neven found fragments of broken pottery, small clay figures, diorite beads, spears and arrowheads, spindle whorls, and other artifacts mostly broken. All right, so this is the death. You see how deep he found this? This was buried under a cataclysm. All right. All right, and we're back in the book just real quick. You know, The Lost Continent of Mu by James Churchward. Just a little closing statement from him. So again, James Churchward, he said he found some tablets called the Nakal tablets in India, right? Which we know the Nakals are just the Nagas, which are the Mayas, right? And also he used the tablets that William Neven found, right? In his uh, uh, discovery here in Mexico, right? So it says the Nakal tablets, which I came across in the Orient, were only fragments of the various subjects with, with many missing links. The Mexican tablets not only confirm the Nakal, but supply many of the missing links. Wow, the Mexican tablets helped them supply the missing links. I spent many years proving as far as possible by experimentation that the facts set forth in these tablets were true. I spent over 50 years in investigation, research, and explorations to prove out what I found written on these in intensely intensely interesting Nakal tablets. I have yet to find the first one that is wrong. The Mexican, like the Nakal, indu indubitably establishes to my own satisfaction that at one time the earth had an incalculably ancient civilization which was in many respects superior to our own and far in advance of us in some important essentials which the modern world is just beginning to have cognizance of. These tablets with other ancient records bear witness to the amazing fact that the civilizations of India, Babylonia, Persia, Egypt, and Yucatan were but the dying embers of the first great civilization. The Oriental Nakal tablets, which formed the foundation of the first edition of this book, were a wonderful history of past man. Neven's Mexican stone tablets are equally wonderful and instructive, if not more so. If not more, it is more so, because they're original. They confirm my contention that the oldest records of man are not to be found in Egypt, all right? Not to be found in Egypt or the valley of the Euphrates. They're talking about over there in Iraq and Mesopotamia. But right here in North America, but right here in North America and in the Orient where Mu planted her first colonies. So he's letting you know subliminally, right? Where, where can you find the oldest records of man? In North America. And then he says it was passed on from there to India via Mu, he says. But he's letting you know straight up North America. If you want to study, do real research of the cradle of humans, where we came from, our origin stories, our, our whole history, how we got civilized, you're going to find that here in North America. Hey, yeah, 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 h